I'm gonna be upfront with you right away for this video. I was very hesitant about making this one, in fact. Highlighting the worst of the year, that doesn't feel completely right. But ultimately, I decided that as a channel interested in reviewing all types of EDM music, regardless of genre or quality, uh, we gotta talk about the bad stuff. And also, just remember that this is purely a subjective list. These are just my opinions, don't take them as gospel truth. Also, I'm gonna do my best to talk about albums that more or less deserve to be on this list. Well, everything here is, yes, my own opinion. There are distinct reasons for them being here other than just, I don't prefer this style of music. So without any further ado, my name is Dakota from Bowtie Media, and let's hop into what I believe to be the top 10 worst EDM albums of 2023. As the years go on and new music is created, genres shift, transform, and sometimes entirely new subgenres pop up. And I don't think that there was any new genre that saw as much attention as Slap House has. Taking off in the last couple years, Slap House has exploded in popularity for its simple beats and easily recognizable tone, making it very radio friendly. And there was one artist that was at the forefront of the Slap House movement. Finally releasing their debut and self-titled album, Medusa was everything I expected from the Kings of Slap. First of all, the record is essentially a best of compilation split into two discs. The first is literally just all their most streamed tracks. That's it. No narrative through lines, no tonal cohesion, just your top charting songs all back to back. Then the second half of this album is just a bunch of random big room tracks. There appears to be no real rhyme or reason for why these exist in its current format. We didn't need a really best of compilation and we don't really need it paired with another random six tracks. Down, down, down. Me, Putting the structure of the record aside, Medusa has never really been a premier producer in the game. That's not to say their stuff isn't bad, it's just constantly meh. You know how you listen to an artist and you can tell that they love their craft. They love making new sounds, playing with new styles, continually improving on their production. Yeah, Medusa uh, ain't that. Uh, <laughs> it really sounds to me like Medusa is just in it for the check. Otherwise, a record like this just doesn't get published. I don't think it's a surprise that a majority of this list will fall into the umbrella dance pop category. Once an artist hits a certain popularity threshold, their motives change. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but there is a certain expectation held for your music from the general masses. 95% of people don't care about the sonic cohesion or narrative through lines of your album. They just listen to the music and don't overanalyze it. And that's okay. It just means that the commercial friendly records are more often dull or derivative versions of what's already found success. And well, derivative is definitely our next entry. Kim Petras had a phenomenal year in terms of finding popularity and hitting streaming charts. Obviously, her collaboration with Sam Smith on Unholy was her truly breakout track, but she followed it up with a very underwhelming record in Feed the Beast. Her dance pop beats and streaming lyrics make for a commercially fruitful record, but much of this track list is overblown, unnecessary, and too typical. I will give Petra some credit for producing an LP with more explicitly EDM influences, more than just your regular dance pop record, but that's really where all my compliments end. This record ultimately suffers from trying to do too much. It tries to be sexy, edgy, intimate, dark, happy, just tries to do it all. But back to that word derivative. Every track here is just a dumbed down, more pop friendly version of something that's already out there. From my understanding, Petrus had a fairly devout fan base with some relatively unique music until that Sam Smith collaboration. Then she took that sound that she found success with and ran with it. Looks like we are all just suffering from her success. Part of the balancing act of making a list like this is trying not to make enemies. Obviously, yes, these are my opinions, but I recognize that what people say about your own creative craft can have an effect. So mini spoiler, but what I try to do is only talk about super popular artists. Medusa isn't going to watch this video. Kim Petrus isn't going to watch this video. When you get down to the niche or EDM artists that are active in the community and really care for it, you might ruffle some feathers. So with that lengthy caveat out of the way, I just want to say, I like a decent amount of what this producer puts out, but this, this is just bad. In what I can only describe as a scattered mind put to the sounds of generic dubstep, Wales's Two Worlds Apart is undoubtedly his weakest project to date. 
At 17 tracks and under 40 minutes long, nothing feels cohesive about this record. Only three of the tracks here are over three minutes long, which means you have a deluge of short, single movement, singular idea tracks. As a listener, you are merely jumping from one random idea to another with no semblance of unity at all. This is what I would dub ADHD dubstep, the album. I do believe Wales puts out some solid tunes and that he can produce some really exceptional tracks. This album just doesn't give me hope for the future. A majority of the tracks are some of the most basic heavy hitting dubstep to hit the market this year. I just don't understand who the target demographic for this album even is. If he wanted to hit the bass heads, he would have expanded upon the ideas of the shorter tracks and cut down the quantity. Uh, if he wanted to hit the melodic fans, he would have made more melodic tracks and not just squish them in between a ton of numerous heavy ones. I know Wales can put together a great LP, it just wasn't gonna be from 2023. This next entrant has been the subject of a bit of controversy this past year for his behavior. And for that, we're just gonna kind of solely look at this album, detached from anything else, because damn, this thing still sucks on its own. Diplo has been in the middle of an identity crisis the last couple years. He put out his worst ever album in 2020 as part one of Diplo Presents Thomas Wesley, then put out two fairly middle of the road records, one house and one ambient, and one of which actually was nominated for a Grammy. But uh, now we're here with Diplo Presents Thomas Wesley, chapter two, Swamp Savant. Other than the ridiculously long title, this album is so forgettable. Jumping back to his dance country production, Diplo fuses together two genres that are just too hard to combine for any real success. With a trackless cut in half from the first part, I can only imagine he put that time into making these few songs more digestible. And well, it sorta of worked. This is not a great record, but at least it showed some more signs of life. But like, Let's just stop here, okay? We don't need chapter three. Two is already enough. You know, I'm glad that Diplo was the only one to try to do the dance pop country fusion this year. Fans of both genres tend to hate the other. Uh, tonally, they just kind of, a bunch of clashing going on. Just happy that there was only one this year. Oh wait. Oh no. All things considered, this could have been much worse. You'd think throwing country vocalists on boring dance pop beats would without a doubt be an abysmal album. It's definitely not the worst thing, but it's still pretty bad. The top half of the track list felt like this record was gonna be maybe not a complete dud, but then pretty much the whole back end is some of Cheat Codes' worst production to date. Bringing on the who's who of the country world for this record, artists like Dolly Parton, Lady A, Nate Smith, all show up to throw some country twang on top of some basic dance beats. Again, this doesn't work. These two genres do not meld together into some magical bliss. You just end up alienating both sides of the spectrum you're trying to reach. But putting all that aside, the execution just did not pan out. Those vocal features, pretty dry and phoned in. The backing production, as vanilla bland as it gets. I had a horrible epiphany recently. The realization that what you thought was incredible as a kid maybe isn't what you remember nowadays. One of my favorite songs as a kid was Owl City's Fireflies, an iconic track with so much jam-packed nostalgia. So earlier this year, I decided to go back and listen to it again. And to my surprise, it was actually pretty great. Uh, I had some quirky lyrics, brilliant synth licks, an impactful breakdown, it does it all. But that's when I made my fatal error. I should go back and listen to the new Owl City album and see what's going on. I did a little dive into Owl City's discography since that 2009 hit, and the man is still trying to replicate the success of Fireflies and has never hit it big since. Coco Moon is an album that's stuck in the 2010s. The once quirky and energetic Owl City feels like a husk of what once was. It doesn't seem like his sound has naturally progressed through the times, and you can only try to tug at nostalgia for so long. Plagued by weak synths and shallow lyricism, this record tries to tug at your feel-good nostalgia, but ends up sounding like a spoiled memory. With little to no variation from track to track, this whole record is just stale. And of the things I don't like to criticize someone on, singing is up there because it's a gift that I don't personally have, and I know how hard it is to work at it. 
But man, Adam's vocal delivery throughout this record is just off-putting. He utilizes copious amounts of key and inflection changes to mask that struggle, but to no avail. This is a new low for Owl City. It's very natural for an artist to pivot their sound into a new genre or style. As we grow as humans, our preferences, wants, desires, they change over time. So why wouldn't the music someone produces as well? In fact, not doing so actually lands you on this list, just like Owl City did. But sometimes an artist finds themselves completely rearranging their identity and core sound. Sometimes it turns their career into a roaring success, and other times you just become a laughing stock. <laughs> Oh, Marshmallow. Homie was done being the butt of the joke in the pop trap world and decided to move over to Latin pop's reggaeton. While I don't believe that this is his worst music yet, it's still egregiously phoned in. Nothing about the shift to this genre has felt genuine. Reggaeton has seen a massive spike in popularity in the last couple years, and with that popularity always comes pretenders, and Marshmallow is exactly that. There appears to be no motive for him to be releasing this kind of music other than money. It just feels so obvious to me. What do you really expect from this other than watered down, flavorless production? I do recognize that with the reggaeton territory comes more simplistic beats, but like, come on, you can do better than this. It sounds like it took all of five minutes for each beat to be made and created in the studio, and I wouldn't be surprised if every one of these tracks were just a default beat from a $20 sampler. The only real good thing I can say about this record is that it's not his worst, and that's a pretty crappy compliment. There are certain artists in the music industry that hit a certain status where they merely become a vessel for other artists to use to further their own success. The best example of this would be the likes of uh, DJ Khaled. No one really likes him. They're just using him to get the sweet, sweet paycheck. And boy, does EDM have its own DJ Khaled. is Steve Aoki anymore. He has no discernible production elements that make him unique. He makes any subgenre of EDM under the sun all to little reward. And to top it all off, his time in the limelight has dwindled. He's not even the mega superstar he was at one point. He's merely grasping at straws trying to make a name for himself as the cake throwing DJ, which I might add is pretty entertaining and a genuinely smart brand <laughs> Steve Aoki's days are sadly numbered, and nothing is more evident than with this new album, HeroQuest 2 Double Helix. Over 70 minutes long and with 23 tracks, there is no semblance of tonal cohesion, consistency, or common themes. It is merely just a myriad of random EDM songs, half of which I'm not even convinced Steve helped create. I would not be surprised if the man just gives his stamp of approval and the song can just show up on the album with his name attached to it. This record is the epitome of doing everything but nothing well. Speaking of washed up artists, this next entrant was once a leading producer in the industry and a household name. They helped lead the mid 2010s EDM pop fusion renaissance, becoming the premier dance pop artist. But their time has passed and they just don't know what to do anymore. From the first breath of this record, I knew the Chainsmokers were in trouble. Obviously the duo hasn't been received well by those who that actually care about music, as they kind of just produce some of the most bland, vanilla, boring dance pop. But like, what's even their career trajectory at this point? When your diehard fans think that this is mid, you are in deep trouble. The Chainsmokers are in desperate need of a remodeling of their sound at this point, because this isn't working anymore. Honestly, I find it really hard to write about the Chainsmokers these days. I feel like I've already said everything about them like two years ago. They're just rinsing and recycling the same track over and over and over and over again. But they get away with it every time because they bring on some huge feature and everyone loses their mind over it all again. It's a self-perpetuating cycle that is now finally starting to catch up with them. Putting the actual music aside for a second though, Summertime Friends was without a doubt the weakest rollout of any project of theirs. It barely got any media attention and their fans just didn't care about it enough to help spread it by word of mouth. I think society has finally realized there's so much more better music out there. Welp, that's it. Those are the top nine worst albums of the year. Wait, nine? That's not 10. Uh, this was supposed to be 10, this is 10, top 10. Uh, Huh. Well, uh, even though this list is the worst albums of the year, I uh, couldn't help myself. There was just something way worse than anything else. It just happened to be an EP. Bye. 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 <laughs>
On his way to trick a whole new demographic of people to listen to his terrible music, Marshmello teamed up with Drop Killers for a pseudo reggaeton, pseudo trap EP titled Mellow Killers. This is it. This is the absolute lowest point for Marshmello. I cannot fathom how a bunch of people got into a room, created this project, and left going, yeah, this is great. Flat kicks, weak snares, basic ass beats, muddy vocals, repetitive lyrics, there's almost nothing going right for this EP. The only slight glimmer of hope is when Mello brings back a old 2016 trap beat, but don't get me wrong, it's not good. It's just stuck in 2016 with no way out. And who even is the audience for this record? In the club, these tracks are short and muddy. At a party, you won't be able to hear much over the awful mixing. Listening by yourself for any capacity, there's just no reason to do that. It's a horrible record and nothing going for it. And the worst part, it's not even doing its job as a cash grab. It's doing relatively poor for Marshmallow numbers streaming wise. There's literally no reason for this to exist. Well, that's been the real top 10 worst albums, sort of EPs of 2023. Let me know what you think of this list. Did I miss any? Should some that were on here not be on here? Let me know in those comment section below. But other than that, I'm Dakota from Bowtie Media, and I'll see you guys in another video.